and I have the great pleasure to introduce the day. Rob O'Dwyer, who's on the other side of the camera that I'm talking to, is going to be your host today. So Rob is going to walk you over the course of the week through all of our full-time programs. Today, he will focus on our carpentry program and our preservation carpentry program. And so you'll get to meet our faculty, our students, you'll see the projects that they're working on in both of those cases. But even if you know that you want to be a carpenter or a preservation carpenter, I encourage you to come back over the rest of the week because we'll still talk with book binders and violin makers and jewelers. And I really encourage you to follow your curiosity about the school. The stories from the different programs are amazing and you might find something you didn't anticipate. So um, with that one Zoom link that you're with me now, you can use that link all week to just keep visiting. Uh, we have two special programs happening also today. At noon, we'll be downstairs in the lobby of our school talking with the Art Jewelry Forum about a project called the Radical Jewelry Makeover. So if you go to our website or our social media and you want to join us for that, you are certainly very welcome. That's at noon today. And then at four o'clock today, there's a sort of a community conversation where I'll be back and you'll get to talk with people who are part of the school right now. You'll get to hear their stories about how they came to North Bennett, why they love the school, what they've been learning here, what they've been teaching here, and just sort of a casual conversation. It's as if you would have bumped into us in the hall and you would have gotten to learn a little bit about people that you meet. So that's a busy day. And then the program continues all week. And so with that, I will turn it over to Rob and he'll go in to meet the Carpenters. Have a great day and I'll get to see you later this week. Sarah, thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Rob. All right, we'll see you later. All right. Hello, good morning. Welcome. Morning. Morning. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. My name is Peter. I'm Brock. We are the two instructors in carpentry. We'll uh, take the next hour and walk you through uh, carpentry, some demos. Uh, we'll start with a demo and then we'll wrap up with a live Q&A. So uh, see if you have questions, we'll take five, 10 minutes at the end to answer any questions live for you. So what we're going to demo, um, we're going to demo coping, hand coping. And what we have are crown molding. A lot of this uh, you'll see at the top of a wall. So when you have a wall and a ceiling, where they meet is where you would find the crown molding. A lot of times crown molding is mitered to fit nicely because you have a profile. So when you have an outside corner, the profiles will come together and they'll match up perfectly and get nailed. Now, if you have an inside corner, so you have a wall and another wall coming in, you need a different kind of joint to fit there that, to, to make it really tight. And that is called a coped joint. So if you were to take this profile and cut the exact shape of the matching profile, you're making a negative out of one piece and fitting it perfectly to the next piece. This is the uh, most accurate way, the most effective way of coping inside corners because of the wood shrinkage. You don't get gaps. Uh, it should be a press fit, as we call it in trim carpentry. So it bites right in. And I'm gonna demonstrate that by hand. And then we'll go through the, the uh, shop space here and we'll end up at the table saw and we'll see how you can actually cope on the table saw. So the first step for coping is you walk over to the chop saw and you make an angle cut and you can start to see how the angle, the bottom is going to come across and meet up. So we start with an angle cut. Then because we're being, we want to be very accurate. You're going to highlight the edge of that because if you don't highlight it, it's very hard to actually see that. So I'm just using the side of the pencil to put a, what probably won't even show up on camera. A black line right at the corner of that. So you can see this black line coming around, comes up here and around. Now I also have to do one more step, which is to square a line across the bottom. So now 
we are going to use a handsaw and we're going to cut right up this profile and we will end up with the back cut out like this. So you, we're going to follow this profile and the order of operations, the order of operations is we're going to cut down from the top. This is our first cut. Then we're going to cut up this long profile. That's the second cut. Then we're going to cut down for our third cut and up and around. So we have one, two, three, four. So let's make that cut. We're going to use a coping saw. I'm going to end up at the outside of the table here, right? So I'm going to pencil this one in too. I already put the line on that one. So our first cut is going to be on the back side here. I'm going to go right up that profile. And the secret to coping is just don't try to push the saw through the cut. Just let the, the blade do all the cutting. So keep the saw moving. Keep the saw moving. And I'm gonna take it out. Then I'm gonna come up here, my second cut. And this whole time, I'm really back beveling the saw. I'm not trying to push the saw through, just letting it cut, trying to track up that cut line. Use my finger to add tension to the blade. So I did the first cut, second cut. Now I'm going to cut down my third cut right in the corner here. Like that. I'm going to come up and around the last profile. Okay. Back cutting the whole time. There we go. So now I can take this and I put it like this. I'm going to get the bottom to come in like that. And we have a coped joint that'll match the profiles on the inside corner. And the reason we're coping, it's easier to install, much easier to cut. Uh, any shrinkage expansion in the wood will still be hidden. If you've done right, there's no need to caulk or anything. It's a press fit, it'll bite in, and it'll stay tight forever. So that's hand coping, and we will go around the machine room and uh, look at what some of the students are doing. And while we're walking around, if we pan down here, when you enter the program, everybody gets a tool list and set up with all the tools you need to be a first time carpenter, right? So it's very important that you understand that we assume that we're getting beginner carpenters, 
uh, right? No one has to be an expert at carpentry. You can come in as a blank slate. You just have to have a passion, desire for carpentry. We give you the tools. We have these Milwaukee packouts that every student gets. And the day one, after introductions, we start labeling and, and undoing all the tools. It's kind of like Christmas on the first day of school. <laughs> so let's walk through to the front bench room, as we call it. So in our bench room, uh, we get to do a lot of unique projects. And it's important that you understand that our goal is to in introduce you to everything you need to build a residential like family house, a house in the suburbs, a house in the city to make ad uh, additions and roof framing is part of it. So one of the units that we go deep into is hip roof framing and gable roof framing. All the topics that we cover are uh, obviously wall framing, 60 on center and two foot on center, uh, so floor systems. We cover stair building, uh, introduction to stair building. So you build a full scale set of stairs. We, we do cabinetry. So you'll be introduced to how to build like kitchen cabinets or building cabinets. Uh, all the cabinets you see in the shop, whether the cherry cabinets out front or any other cabinets were built by the students over the years. So we really do try to give you uh, a little vignette on all the topics that you need to know so that you can have a career in front of you. Uh, here are the students doing, we're finishing up hip roof framing this week and we're gonna trim those out. We're gonna go into the machine room and we'll try coping on the, on the, uh, the table saw. That's great. Thank you, Peter. Hi, right. Hey, Brock. We're on the backside. Sorry. You're good. Okay. So you just saw with Peter how um, you can cope with a hand saw. So a more traditional method for coping uh, profiles, whether that's crown molding or chair rail or baseboard cap, there, wherever you've got a, a profile in a piece of trim on a building, you can cope with a handsaw in order to get a nice inside corner fit. That's one of the keys, inside corner fit. Um, there are two other methods that we cover predominantly as a department, using a grinder to cope an inside corner, as well as using a table saw. So let me show you how to cope with a grinder real quick. Uh, bear with me for a second as I gear up. As always, with everything we do, we try to have a focus. I just saw uh, Rob was holding the camera for us, just threw his safety glasses on. Everything, <laughs> everything we do, there's always a focus on making sure that we have safety with the students in everything we teach. So making sure that we've got appropriate protective equipment, personal protective equipment, so your PPEs. I'm gonna wear my earmuffs and my safety glasses while I run a grinder, and then I'm gonna run the table saw. Okay, so I'll show you grinder first, and then I'm gonna go into the table saw. A couple of things to think about while you're using them. So just like with the coping saw, I've gotta think about the direction of material, the grain that I'm working with, and ensuring that I'm using the tool in a safe way. This is just a regular, uh, four and a half inch angle grinder that I've outfitted with two 24 grit uh, sanding discs that are back to back so I can use the tool in either direction. Okay, I'm going to use this to remove all the material and get a nice coped edge just like this one. All right, here we go.
Now, just as with a hand coping exercise, that's a roughing exercise. So I, I've, I've removed most of the material, just like with the coping saw by hand, I would have removed most of the material. And then I've got to switch over to a selection of whatever my preferred files or rasps are, different shapes in order to get into the crevices of the profile and clean all that up. So real quick, with a nice half round file, I can get in and clean up and remove the rest of the material. right back to my lines. And I'll use my one from before. ideas to how that's going to look. A little more fine tuning and adjustment to put into that one, but you get the idea. A nice, slightly faster way uh, using one of our mechanized tools that we have with us in the shop. We want to emphasize a traditional way of doing something, understanding why we're coping, um, where coping comes from in technique, how it would have been done before the advent of powered or cordless tools uh, that could help us speed the process up, but having to get down the fundamentals first before we move into something uh, that makes us a little more efficient as a carpenter. Speaking of efficiency, let's move over to the table saw and I'll show you what that looks like. So the table saw is an option for me when I've got a piece of stock that is what I'm gonna refer to as flat back stock. So it's a flat back, it's meant to sit against the wall. It is not a sprung profile. A sprung profile being something like crown molding that extends off of the wall. So it has a spring angle to it where it sits out, it would meet the ceiling and the wall uh, and make a nice detail at the top of a wall. Something like this profile here is flat back. It's designed to sit flat against the wall. It does not lean out again away from the wall at all. Because it has this flat back on it, it's an ideal choice to use on a table saw. Let's see how that would look. When I go to use a table saw, just like when I'm using the grinder or using a coping saw, I have to pay attention to the material. I have to make sure I'm not removing too much material at any one time, putting too much lateral force on the table saw blade. Uh, making sure that I'm removing just a, a, a safe amount of material, not putting too much pressure on the table saw blade, and not wanting to destroy the material uh, while I'm working on it. Again, safety first, safety glasses on, ear protection on. Normally, I'm going to leave it off for this time, but normally we would also turn on our dust collection system, better for our saws, better for our lungs, and we can get all the dust out of our tools while we're using them. But I'm going to leave it off because it's a very loud machine inside this echoey chamber we're in. Thank you, Brock. Okay, here we go.
accuracy on all these methods is amazing. So just like with my pumping saw or with a grinder or a jigsaw or a table saw, it's a rough exercise. I've removed most of my material and now I've got to go and fine tune it and get something that hopefully looks like that. Not too bad. Not bad. Thank you. So that's another option. We cover about four different techniques for coping when we do interior trim work, whether it's uh, hand coping with a coping saw, with a grinder, with a jigsaw, or with a table saw, and then having to clean that up with files and rasps and get a nice tight fit. We're trying to aim for really tight tolerances, no light coming through. Um, we don't want to rely on wood glue or putties or uh, fillers of any kind. We want our woodwork to stand for itself and not have to be uh, covered up by the painter when they come through after us. That's the goal anyway. That's great. So while we're in the machine room, let's take a look at like, the machine room because like all the woodworking departments, we have a full machine room. So we have a, a jointers, right? Um, we have a table saws. We have, and the students are gonna, we have three table saws, two jointers, two thickness planers. And one of the important things that we do is we spend, we spend a week learning how to tune up and dial these machines in through uh, machine maintenance. We have guest style lectures. And so that has been invaluable for a lot of people to graduate where they can walk into a shop and know how to tune up a table saw, know how to tune up the, the joint, the band saw. So we use this shop to build our cabinet lessons. Uh, we use it all the time, in fact. So we'll, we'll come out here and we will look at, uh, pan over to the right and look at some of the chair cabinets. Thanks, Brock. Yeah. So we have all the white upper shelves, all the lower shelves the students put them last year. Uh, so do you want to talk about that, Brock? That's fine. Sure. So every year, uh, as Peter talked about, we have a cabinet lesson. Uh, last year, we decided to use the department for the cabinet lesson. So that gave us a chance to build uh, cherry lowers and poplar uppers, poplar uppers. So we could have a painting, cabinet painting lesson. Um, and then the cherry lowers so we can cover uh, natural or, or uh, finishes that would allow you to bring the grain of the wood through. Uh, so these are all covered in or coated, uh, finished with a uh, boiled linseed oil and pine tar mixture. Uh, the uppers are painted. This lesson is not only a, a sheet good lesson dealing with uh, plywoods, dealing with cabinet geometry, dealing with hardwoods. This is a solid cherry top. These doors are solid cherry uh, rail and style with a cherry plywood panel. With a pre-finished maple interior. The uppers are the same plywood carcasses with a poplar face frame that's been painted. This allows us to talk about cabinet construction, finishing, uh, trim techniques, as well as the installation of cabinetry, scribing things to a surface. We, used, we had a brick surface in the back for the cabinet, uh, excuse me, the countertop we scribed to. That was a challenge on itself. It's not square either side. So lots of different challenges in order to get this set of cabinets in this space. Peter talked about earlier, as we were walking out of the machine shop, that students learn how to maintain the machines. It goes back to everything we do. There's fundamentals, and then using the Sloyd method from North Bend Street, you're building on everything. So you're learning the fundamentals of how to sharpen your tools by hand so that you have effective block planes and chisels as you're using them uh, while you're doing trim work, while you're framing, you have to have sharp tools. Well, same thing, when we go into use machines, if you don't know how to maintain the machines, then we end up with poor quality work coming out of our machine work. If we don't keep our joiners and planers really well tuned up, well, then you're, you're gonna end up with subpar material coming out on the other side that you're then trying to make cabinet doors or cabinet countertops or saw horses out of no matter what it is even if it's something as simple as a toolbox or a set of saw horses we have to make sure that our fundamentals in the techniques we're using to build something as well as the techniques we use to maintain our machines and our tooling all have to be 
up to par, up to our standards so that we can move forward and, and progress and use that Sloyd method to learn something, try it again at a, at a more intense level, and then progress past that. Thank you. You, you want to take us out to the front? Yeah. So we know that you're coming into the program. You're coming into the program as beginners. And that is absolutely a great reason, a great place to come to North Bend as beginners. We know you're going to make mistakes. We want you to make mistakes. We want you to make a mistake and we'll make sure we have extra stock. So these rafters, we don't buy the exact number of rafters, we buy extra so you can practice cutting them. We uh, demonstrate, I'll, Brock and I will demonstrate the cut, we'll talk you through like what, how we're holding our fingers, how we are actually looking at the blade when we're making cuts. So a lot of knowledge can be gained online from like YouTube and uh, just Google, right? We've all done that. But the reality is, it's the combination of the knowledge with the muscle memory in the hands and the ability to visualize, to execute the work. That's why you come to North Bend because you want to learn the hands-on component, not just this is a hip roof, this is a hip rafter, but how do you do the map? How do you hold the framing square? How do you even use the skill saw to make a, a nice cut coming down the end of the uh, rafter tail? So part of the, the whole program is actually, we will go through, uh, and the students will be doing this right after Christmas. We go through a week of learning CAD drawing through SketchUp. So you will have like basically one-on-one -on -one training through online. The students will, after Christmas will stay at home for the week after Christmas. They will jump on a Zoom meeting every day and for uh, several hours a day with breaks to work independently, they will learn SketchUp online. So you will go through and be introduced to SketchUp. You will be drawing uh, not only like the roof frame, but the next iteration of this framing is to build a small room with doors and windows and drywall and finished floor. So stairs. stairs, we will go through all the steps. So CAD is also a very important uh, part of our program. It's not going to make you an expert. It's just going to introduce it to you. Um, and students have really run with that to help them in their career. So besides the roof framing, um, this will be dismantled. Then we build the small room. So we cover installing windows and doors. We cover how to order windows and doors. We know that uh, a lot of people are used to going to Home Depot, which is fine, but we'll introduce you to lumber yards, which brings to bear like a relationship with the lumber yard where you learn how to interact with the sales rep, you learn how to call up and ask questions, like what's the material like you might recommend for this or how to order material. So there's all this, this nomenclature, these terms associated with carbon, carbon day, like what's a 16 penny nail? What's, why is a two by four, not two by four, right? So there's so much little, thing, um, it's just so much to learn in carpet day. It's endless, right? So we, we start out slow and then we ramp up. And at the end of the year, we go outside to do real world projects for real clients that are paying real money with a contract and everything else. And we spend about two months. Um, the, the clients this year, we're gonna build a full kitchen and remodel the whole kitchen and, and rebuild a back wall with new windows. We are going to go to another client and build, they have horse horses and we're going to build some um, at sheds at that small buildings for the horses to go into in the paddock. Uh, we're going to get into timber framing. So we try to introduce timber framing. Uh, that's, that's both Brock and I love timber framing. So we do try to get it. If there's time in the curriculum to get timber framing introduced, there's just, just a ton of information to cover, but we know we're all starting from the same point. Like, how to read the tape measure, how to put a little uh, arrow right next on a piece of wood to, to clearly mark where you're, where you're supposed to cut. So sometimes the students, students are always asking like, what are our tolerances? Our tolerances are you that you split the pencil line when you make cuts. Do we think you can do that right off the bat? No. Do we think it'll take a year and then some? Sure, but we're here 
to, to encourage you to work to that tie lines where you're cutting the pencil line with your skill saw, right? Where you learn how to read plumb with the bubble on the uh, level perfectly in the center. Uh, and all of that just takes time and experience. And Brock are here more than here to help you gain that experience. Um, the, the, we're trying to give you, we're trying to give our students the skills, the fundamentals, and the background to go and work in any aspect of residential construction that might be of interest to them. Whether that's working with a trim crew or a framing company or a general contractor that's doing foundation up, we're really looking to give our students the skills, the knowledge, and the techniques necessary to jump in with any company. We, we want to ensure that you find a part of residential construction that is your, that, that captures your interest, whether it's trim or framing or uh, decking or roof work or stair construction. There's something in residential co construction that will appeal to each and every one of our students. And we're trying to give you the skills necessary to go and jump in with a company that specializes in that so that you can start your career in the direction that you were hoping to. We're trying to make sure that you have a well-rounded construction, residential construction education so that you can jump in with any crew, no matter where you are in the country, because we get students from all over the country that are coming here to learn from North Bennett Street School instructors and then are going to head back home. We have a, a student right now from the Mid-Atlantic region who's looking forward to heading back home at some point and working in residential construction in the Virginia, Maryland area. We want to give somebody the skills. It's not just a Massachusetts education that, that will uh, allow you to take those skills and transfer wherever you want across the country. Um, but it focuses on a repetitive, Sloyd-based, residential platform framing construction background, giving you all the skills, bringing in great guest instructors, whether that's on stairs or building science or building code compliance. We're trying to bring in the people with the specialized nuanced information from the industry that can give you the upper hand when you head out in the job market trying to get a job and to be impactful with whatever company you join as soon as you leave North Bennett Street. So that when you leave here in May, uh, you're able to jump right in with a company and be a member of the crew and not have to worry about catching up. You have to learn their lingo, but as soon as you're on the right page with the folks you're working with, you're right in. That's what we're aiming for. So, yeah, so some of you are sitting out there like, I'm gonna pay a lot of money, I'm gonna come to school, what's the job market like? So one of the benefits of coming to North Bennett is that you get plugged into the alumni and student job and commission board. So every week, at least for the last two or three years, about two or three jobs in Carpentry are posted every week to the password protected uh, job board. So students can jump on there and look at what's coming through. Students can jump on there and say, oh, there's somebody in my town that wants a door rehung or wants a little cabinet built or once the deck uh, put on. Brock and I are more than happy to help you advise you on how to do that. But the reality is you would have to not want a job right now in carpentry. The carpentry, uh, if you at all pay attention to the news, it's just red hot, red hot. Like So um, we have contractors calling all the time asking, can we get students, can we get students? And we encourage you because the, the work week for us is Monday through Thursday. That gives you Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. A lot of students are uh, will take that Friday and that Saturday to work with a contractor. It's great. You get two days in the field. You get to come back into school and apply and learn even more. So yes, there is a very strong job market. Yes, we give you me means of actually getting those jobs through our job portal. And any student right now that wants a job can have a job. That'll be true for you next year. Uh, and uh, it's just a, an unbelievably time to actually jump into carpentry. So we're going to go out front and we'll do some Q&A. We'll take a look at the cherry cabinets. Great. So we did have a question uh, that came out um, because Brock mentioned Sloyd. And I'll just, um, I'll just give a, a simple answer there for our viewer. Um, first, I encourage you to, to research what Sloyd is. Um, North Bennett Street School um, 
is, is based on Sloyd educational methodology. Uh, the two simple things about Sloyd is that through repetition, you create muscle memory. Uh, and we begin with things that are simple and build upon each, uh, build upon each step to become more complicated, uh, much like the cabinets that, uh, that we see behind us. Certainly, you don't start out the first month or two in the carpentry department building cabinets. We work up to that. We work through building the, the, the phases of, of residential construction as though we were building a home. We talk about simple projects. We build a set of sawhorses. We build a toolbox. Basic skills to give you kind of a ramp up into um, construction. So that way you are now comfortable or, or gaining a, a level of comfort with your basic tools that you're going to need on every one of our projects. From there, we're heading into framing, floor framing, wall framing, roof framing. It's, it's rough construction. You can be, um, you can have an off day and it's not going to hurt you. We can try and fail and grab another piece of wood and give it another shot. And it's not a big deal. That's why you're here in school to make mistakes, to learn from those mistakes and to keep going, building on each of those skills. We, we, Disassemble our knee wall and roof lesson. We build Bennett Town, so now you have full height walls. We're installing windows and doors. Peter just mentioned this a few minutes ago. Trim, drywall, paint, finished floor, set of stairs, and you're building on each one of those lessons. It's not an immediate ramp through all of it. There's times for us to backpedal for a, a moment or two for a week so that we can refocus on something that's a, a vital skill to spend a little more time focusing down on, and then moving from there into some of the more uh, really precise technical work like cabinet construction, taking the skills from stair lesson. Stair lesson is very technical, uh, very skilled, um, has really tight tolerances, and using that same structure and moving into a cabinet lesson. Same again, tight tolerances. Um, materials that have to be uh, near perfect in construction in order to get an a, a usable set of cabinets. We can't have things that are out of square or out of level uh, in a set of cabinets. In order to get the drawers and doors to work properly, they have to be constructed constructed uh, in in our best way possible in order to get that cabinet to turn out really really well. So, building on all those skills and then unleashing those skills on the spring project, like Peter was talking about the horse sheds and the um, kitchen um, this year. So taking that culmination of skills that you've built up for seven months or so, yeah. and then taking that out for two months in the spring and giving it a whirl and seeing how you feel on an active job site um, where we start amping up the pressure. There's now weather issues. There's real customers that we're building for. Um, having to understand the relationships between your vendors, like your HVAC, electrical, plumbing, architects, design expertise, all those folks, building inspectors, how to get all that to work together on a job and get something to, to finish on time and on budget, which are not yeah. things we can ignore about the residential construction world. Those, those were very real constraints of scope, schedule, and cost. Do you have questions that are coming through online? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask right now, you, um, uh, you heard Peter, if anybody out there in our audience has any questions, uh, please, um, you can put them up in the chat, uh, and I have the ability to see it here, and uh, and I can ask. Yeah. So I can go over some things that uh, students stress about coming into the program, right? Great. So we stress about the math, right? Like, I'm never going to read a tape measure, right? I cannot find a 15 16 for a life me. That's okay. You're going to start out and it's going to be a little overwhelming, but we will, the more you do it, the more that you work through it, the easier it gets. Roof framing that. We go through that. We repeat the process every morning with a, a math problem. And so you learn how to convert, uh, you know, decimals to fractions and vice versa. So don't let math or the, the lack of math steer you away from coming to North Bennett. Um, we use a lot of math, but we have lots of different techniques for dealing with that. And it's as simple as learning how to use the framing square. All those mysterious numbers on the framing square are, are beautiful to the carpenter because we learn how to use them. We don't have to do the math. We can go to the framing square and say, oh, there's the number I'm looking for, right? But you gotta know how to find that number. Um, another concern is, um, you know, 
when you're in North Bennett, every student that graduates comes back and says, I can't believe how much I learned, but didn't realize I was learning. So everything you're doing is going to help you ramp up your career because we're not going to make you master carpenters, right? You're not nine months full time, but we will definitely give you a very sharp learning curve so that when you jump in onto a crew, as Brock said, you can kind of learn how that carpentry crew works and you can just kind of dovetail in or fold in very nicely. So we are, we are excited to see some of you here next year. We definitely, you can reach out to us. You can reach out to, to Rob. Uh, we're more than happy to, to come. One of the questions we get usually from students is, should I do carpentry or PC, right? So carpentry or preservation carpentry. Carpentry is nine months, one year. Preservation carpentry is two months. One of the advice I, I suggest is that you look into the textbooks that we use. So we use a, a textbook for carpentry. They use the same textbook in PC, preservation carpentry, but they add on to it with some other books. If the carpentry books, uh, just like learning modern tools, modern machines is what really gets you interested in carpentry, that's probably the program for you. If taking out a wooden hand plane or an ax, and reading through books on how they did it in the 18th and 19th century. If that kind of speaks to you, then maybe PC is the angle you want to go to. So don't be afraid to reach out and uh, kind of just have a conversation. We'll end up talking on the phone and we can talk through what program might work for you. Um, but yeah, we've had a really good time. Really appreciate you stopping by uh, and we hope to see you next year. That's great. Peter, thanks so much. Um, I just, Robert, yeah, please. please go. Please understand if you're looking into one of the programs at North Bennett Street School, it doesn't end when you're graduated, when, when you've left here, excuse me. Um, one, we get a lot of students that repeat programs that, that come from one program and go to another. It's not uncommon for a carpentry student to head down to preservation carpentry and spend another two years in the building. But if you choose to graduate and move on and start your career, the relationship doesn't end there. We are constantly in communication with graduates who've been out in the field working and are reaching back out and saying, hey, how can I reconnect with school to come in and help out? Also, hey, this is what I'm up to. Can you send some more students our direction? I like the company I'm at and I'm looking for, we're looking for new um, carpenters to join us. We're always in connection with our alumni uh, trying to get them to come in and help us improve the program and help them keep going, give them more connections out in the working world, uh, make sure that they are happy and healthy and successful wherever they've planned it after they've left uh, the North Bennett Street school building um, after graduation. So it, it, it's a nine month program, but it doesn't end after nine months. Your connection here at school um, can stay with you the rest of your life. Yeah. So if, That's if great. you want to have you on, you yeah. can look at some of the previous projects, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about just trimming out, right? So you have a, a freeze, a soffit, a fascia, like a shadow or shingle mold and a drip edge, right? We're going to get in, into the field to do that. This is actually exactly where the students are uh, that you've walked around the roof systems. They're going to install the soffit and the, and the fascia on their little models. So we get into that. Um, we're using uh, one year, they were able to go out to the satellite campus and build sheds. That was one of their projects. The big thing about carpentry is we want to use as much modern tools. So we're looking for like the, the cordless drill, the cordless saw, the cordless that, you know, that's the way the industry is going. We're moving away from corded tools. So you're going to get cordless tools. In our packouts, you're gonna get a cordless skill saw, a cordless jigsaw, a cordless drill, and a cordless impact gun, right? So you're you're gonna get set up with quite a lot. We have a lot of the corded, so we have corded chop saws that you can use. We have all, so all the tools you'll need, right? So here's another project, a spring project, in which they build a garage for somebody out in the field and this is exactly what we're trying to get you to, to ramp up to, is to go out, do modern framing, modern tools, and, and to, uh, to rock it out in the real world, right? So uh, we get into a little timber framing. A lot of times, well, what is timber framing, right? So timber framing is nothing more 
then joining wood together using mortise and tenon or traditional joints with wooden pins. So a timber frame stands up without metal fasteners in it. Post and beam, that's another phrase. Post and beam is where you have big metal steel plates kind of gusseting the timbers together. So post and beam, we don't get into that too much, but we definitely try to cover a little bit of timber framing. Why? Every house that you do an addition on is gonna have timber frame, right? So if, if every, for 200 years, there's timber frame in America, when you open up the wall to build your addition, you're gonna be looking at a timber frame. So we get, in, get into timber framing. Um, the last photo over here is we get into stair building, right? Mm -hmm. So you're gonna build a full set of stairs. Uh, you're gonna learn how to describe the skirt board. You're gonna learn how to put in the rises, the treads and do all the math behind that. And you're gonna have a chance to, to work through that process in small groups. And it's just yet another skill set that you're gonna ramp up to, to use in the real world. So we, we think our department is pretty darn special because we get you for nine months. You get to see where you are a year later and off and running in your career. We have, uh, thankfully, um, we've had plenty of students that just come back naturally and want to speak to the students that, that are in the program. One, because a lot of students are like, we're learning all this. It's, it, they, ha, they get to apply it in the classroom, but what's it like in the real world? All the students that are coming back talking about it say, you know, absorb as much as you can here because you use it almost from day one, right? I have a student this year that's working on a job site and he was working with somebody else that was new to carpentry and they were trying to pick up the stack of lumber. And, and my student said, Hey, you should try it this way. Cause he had just learned it like two weeks earlier, how to carry the lumber and get it up onto your shoulder the easiest way possible. So like tiny little things like that, that you just don't even think about. No one's sitting there on YouTube, how to carry a pack of lumber the right way or how to shrink wrap lumber up the right way. But that's the reality, right? There's so much learning. Just uh, when we get deliveries, how do you take a delivery of lumber and, and offload it quickly and keep it out of the dirt? Um, meeting on uh, tours. So we will go to a lumber yard, as I mentioned earlier, but we also go to a sawmill and we see how a tree turns into our two by four stock and we meet the owner. So, I mean, one of the greatest things about North Bennett is it's not just carpentry that you're coming to join. You're joining the North Bennett community. Brock mentioned that, but that includes like all these vendors that we have, right? So we have sawmills and we have electricians and we have HVAC. We have just a, a whole web of, of uh, unique specialists in their trades that we can call on and we do project tours with some of our advisors who are contractors and graduated. So um, it's, it's just an amazing resource that allows you to plug into a North Bennett community. Uh, we cover a lot of ground in nine months. What does the day look like, right? So the typical day looks like 7.30 on the nose we start. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you right now, you might as well know, 15 minutes early is on time, on time is late. So we start <laughs> at 7.30, uh, we go to 9.30, we have a coffee break. We go to 12.45 uh, and we have a lunch break. The day we clean up starting around four o'clock and we're, we're out of here when we're cleaned up by 4.30, right? One thing you need to be mindful of is all these tour projects that happen outside, they're great, but you have to get yourself to that project, right? You are 100% uh, expected to drive and be on the job site at 7.30. The job sites we try to keep within the 4.95 interstate beltway of Boston. So uh, we had jobs this past year in Haverhill. That's just on the other side up north. The jobs this year are going to be in Upton and Franklin. Uh, so you need to kind of prepare yourself to be able to commute to those job sites, just like you would to any other job, right? So um, when we leave the North End in the end of March, beginning of April, to go to these job sites, you pack up your tools, and the rest of the school year is actually in the field. So um, the first, what would you expect the first week of school? It's a great question. Everyone comes in with the same level of stress. It's a big change. Some of you are making career changes. Some of you are coming straight out of uh, schooling and you decided not to go the four-year college BABS route. You wanted to actually get into the trades. 
uh, and you can make good money in the trades. Uh, so you've decided to come to North Bennett. Everybody's making a big change in their life coming to North Bennett, right? Just that's a no brainer. So you're, day one, we introduce you to the building. We take a walking tour of the north end of Boston because we live in an amazing and work in an amazing environment, uh, in historic north end. Uh, we get into all the tools, unpacking the tools, and we get into, within the first week, how to use some of those tools, how to read the tape measure. We get into drafting. We do a little bit of drafting where you have to learn to draw full scale on like a piece of plywood or some paper, your toolbox, your sawhorses. And we start using those tools right away. Uh, so there is a lot of ground that we covered, but I cannot stress enough that you're coming into a North Bennett community and everyone's making the big change to get here. So enjoy the ride when you decide, when you sign up and commit. Peter, thank you. I think we've got a, probably about five minutes or so is my guess. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come across the transom. I'm just gonna um, pick those up uh, if I can, and, and I'll ask Peter and Brock uh, to help um, as needed. Uh, some of the questions, and I know uh, that the staff on the chat has been sharing things as well, um, but the, there's been questions about tuition. Um, uh, there's been questions about admissions requirements. Uh, those are all available on our excellent website. So I would encourage you uh, to please take a look at nbss.edu um, and uh, you can see what the requirements are, what the tuition is. And just as important as tuition is uh, financial aid and North Bennett Street School scholarship. Uh, we're an accredited institution. We're accredited by the ACCSC. Uh, and with that relationship, you can apply for financial aid through FAFSA. Once you do that, it takes about three business days for that application to arrive here. And we will automatically consider you for a full range of scholarship that's available um, to uh, qualified students. Um, I will also add that this Friday, I'll be hosting uh, an information session at 11 a.m. after our visit to bookbinding. Um, you can use this link to get there. Um, and then we, we do have information sessions most Mondays at noon. I'm happy to do custom info sessions, phone calls, uh, Zoom connections. Uh, and now we are able to uh, bring visitors uh, into the school in small groups for safety. Um, so we have the ability to do that. Um, and, and we'll be picking all that up in the month of January when we return uh, from winter break. Uh, one of the questions I'm going to ask you for help, uh, Peter, is a lot of a lot of interest in the packouts. One of the questions was, um, you know, are they on loan? No, they are not. Um, these uh, everyone purchases tools as part of the program. Information about uh, the cost uh, is on the website, um, and, and as has been mentioned by faculty earlier, we're setting you up for a successful career. So you purchase these tools, you learn how to use them, maintain them, uh, and, and bring them with you when you graduate. And then there was a question about sort of a, a little bit of a tour. I know these things are complex, but. No, no, so. I mean, the pack out is a, in Milwaukee, everybody in the industry is kind of mimicking. So you can go to Home Depot, Rigid. These pack outs are individual boxes that lock together and come apart. They have improved the pack out. Uh, so this pack out represents like last year's version. The new ones we get will have drawers. Huh. So the same concept that you can take them apart, but instead of having to dig through them to open them up, you can then open up drawers, right? So right. every year we uh, get into the pack outs and uh, it's just a way to keep it organized. It's something that you'll have for the rest of your life. You actually are on YouTube. One of the advantages, one of the realities is when COVID hit, we jumped online two years ago. So Brock and I have combed through a lot of online resources. So what we end up doing is saying, you should watch this YouTube channel or you should watch, uh, listen to this podcast. So 
for example, Spencer Lewis, right? He's a trim carpenter out in Indiana. Fantastic, right? You want to see how his pack up set up? That's a great, great resource. So we can direct you to what we think are actually legitimate professionals in the field doing real tasks, right? So whether that's Robin Clevett in England, whether that's, uh, you know, the podcast, a modern craftsman, right? So there's lots of information on the YouTube. Not all of it's good. So come to us and we can go. So go for, tell you how to find the best YouTube channels. So we hope to see you next year. We're really glad that you spent the hour with us. Uh, and give us a shout out to us. Give us an email, Rob, contact Rob, and we'll be in touch. Peter, thank you so much. Brock, thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for coming. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that is our visit to the nine month uh, carpentry program. Um, uh, we want you to stay tuned. Uh, right after this, uh, we're we're going to show you uh, a project that we worked on for preservation carpentry. Uh, we pre-filmed that one uh, last week because uh, we, we had some scheduling challenges. So it is in a very similar format. Um, we also will be staffing the chat as we were um, earlier. Uh, and then as Sarah mentioned um, at the top of the hour, uh, this is a great week for visiting everything at North Bennett Street School. Uh, at noon, uh, there's the Radical Jewelry Makeover. You can visit our website and there's a separate sign up to attend there. And then there's also uh, In the Making, uh, uh, which is uh, the topic is about uh, people's connections to uh, North Bennett Street School and, and experiences. So please uh, join those and join us for Preservation Carpentry up next. And uh, the balance of the week, we'll be visiting bookbinding, jewelry making, violin making. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the preservation carpentry segment of uh, Open House. Uh, I'm here with Stephen O'Shaughnessy, who's the head of the program and uh, also a graduate. How are you, Stephen? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good, good. Uh, Preservation Carpentry at North Bennett begins about 1984-85, founded by uh, Robert Adam, who taught the program for 24 years. And I taught alongside of Robert for several years. He's now retired, but still an advisor to this program. So I speak to him, I spoke to him yesterday, uh, the man who founded the program. And the idea was, back then, he pitched the idea, you know, we have all this historic architecture here in New England. Um, we don't have any training for people who need to learn very specific, specific skills to work on old buildings. Um, what do you think? And that pitch led to Robert being given the uh, opportunity to teach uh, at first a one-year program, and then the very next year they hired an assistant and it became a two-year program, and it has been ever since. So it's around 1985. And uh, I've been teaching here as a department head and teaching for 16 years, so I'm in my 16th year of teaching. And um, Preservation Carpentry is now uh, one of the, uh, the eight programs. Uh, what do we do? We, we work on, uh, they used to say that Preservation Carpentry was the restoration of pre-20th century architecture. But as time is slipping forward, uh, we have been approached by folks who are, who are loving their, what, 1917 bungalow or their 1920s modernist. That happens. So let's just say uh, restoration of early architecture. That's basically what we do. And uh, it's a two-year program, as I mentioned, where we take students in year one and teach them fundamental skill building. That's done at the bench, in our machine shop, and in the field, working out in the field in actual historic context on a building. And um, most of their time is spent uh, in, at their benches and in the machine room in year one. And in year two, with those fundamental skills in place, they continue on with the second instructor, Michael Burry, who you will meet today. You'll, you'll, you'll say hello to Michael. And um, Michael can take them to do, go and do bigger projects, more, more elaborate projects, projects that require the basis of skills, understanding of skills, hand skills, machine skills, and then build upon that to do, to do more complex work. We do also have a nine month uh... Uh, carpentry program that is modern residential stick framing and finish work. Um, 
when I compare preservation carpentry and carpentry for people that are trying to think of which one is a better fit for them, uh, sometimes I will I'll make mention that in the nine month carpentry program, you will learn to install prefabricated doors and windows. In preservation carpentry, uh, you'll have the opportunity to learn how to build a panel door um, and a window and install it. And then so that, that, um, that lends itself to sort of the, the, the richness of the program, the length and the depth of the program. Um, what else can you think of in sort of uh, uh, comparing or, or uh, sharing the specialization of preservation? Let me get this name again. Robert Adam realized pretty quickly that the content of what he wanted to teach was too great to cover in one year. And yet the carpentry program continued on. And carpentry, carpentry as a program, as a nine month session, is a good fit for folks who want to work in new construction or renovation. Still renovation and, uh, is possible within that, particularly who's teaching the program. But um, perhaps a, a fit for someone who needs more, uh, more immediate gratification in the, the end of the day's work, what have, I, what have I accomplished? Okay, let's move on. And the pace is fast. You're learning <coughs> a lot of things, but moving in quick succession through the curriculum because you have nine months to cover. Great skills are learned. It's really a great fit for certain types. Now, preservation, given two years, we can stretch and slow things down a bit, develop more skills, particularly hand skills, and touch upon more, more um, topics that are at the periphery of carpentry as well. For instance, uh, learning in different mediums like metal and stone and lime plaster and mortars, and they're, they're always with us in these old houses. And we expose students to this and learn, uh, have them uh, put their hands in this work as well. And we've had quite a few graduates who have peeled off, not from proper carpentry, but have gone into restoration masonry or gone into metal work. And so our curriculum includes these other topics as well. That's great. Yeah. So it's very focused, but also through the experience that you have, it can lead uh, to a, a different pathway Possibly. based on um, the interest you pick up, the skill and the opportunity. That's right. So Stephen, you mentioned in comparing these two programs that there's sort of a, a maybe a type of person that is attracted to either pathway. Right. Um, would you share with, uh, with us um, what are some of the things that you either see in people that are heading towards preservation where it's, it's, a, it's a better fit for them or, or, uh, and or what kind of qualities do you look for in people? Okay, well, I, I look for someone who perhaps is someone who has a bit more patience, uh, someone who can focus and knows this about themselves, that they are maybe someone who really has an interest in history in reading about uh, historical um, uh, activities or, and of course, having an interest in old houses doesn't hurt. That should be at the core. Someone who really likes to work with their hands and likes history and architecture. With those, uh, with those basic principles, we can take almost anyone fundamentally through the program. Uh, so uh, we have students from all backgrounds, right? We have 18 year olds right out of school. Now that school might have been a trade school and there's the hook, there's the connection. They have already figured out at 16, 17, 18 that they want to work with their hands. Uh, so that's a good fit. Uh, but we have a lot, most of our students are career changers. And their, their backgrounds are really diverse, as you know. No one mm -hmm. knows better than you. We have students that have done all kinds of things in their background. But their interests may still lie with working with their hands, uh, history, and architecture. And with those things, using Robert Adams' progressive method, which is really based on what all the programs are based on, the Sloyd system of progressive fundamental skills built upon um, more complex, more complex sort of building, where we do great things like what I'm leaning on here, and if you can move the camera right. to the left and up, our exhibit here at the school, the reproduction, full-scale reproduction of the 1737 
John Hancock Man Mansion's entryway, uh, which has been a phased project over several years. This doesn't happen with students who've just come into the program. This is a second year uh, activity after the skills have been laid down and they can then go and do great things like build doors and windows, do carving, elaborate carving, laying out proportions. Uh, this exhibit is great as a showcase for all the things that we do, one of many things that we do. That's great. And I, I love this project. Um, the connected to my last question too, um, around uh, candidates for the program, mm -hmm. we get a lot of questions in admissions about, um, do I need to have construction experience before I come here? And I think when I started here, I looked at this program as almost a kind of like a graduate program in some way where having construction experience could be very helpful. But over time, I think working with you, Stephen, uh, we've been able to identify that there's a spectrum of people where maybe transferable skills or something else. So would you speak about that a little bit, about what experience you might be looking for from sure. people as well? It doesn't hurt to have someone who has been paid to work with their hands, has a tool belt, experience working on job sites, have worn a tool, tool belt, own tools, understand that environment, it certainly does not hurt, but in no way is it required. Uh, because, again, we start in such a basic way. We start here in this building in the opening days talking about tools and even restoring vintage tools. And there I start to see in my students whether they have this aptitude, which is all we need, is that the aptitude to understand that if something is broken, not working, missing parts, can we bring it back? It starts at a base level of the actual tool, which has the capacity for being an heirloom tool to last for them and be a great part of their kit for the rest of their career. And was probably already in someone else's kit and is 100 years old now. So anyway, I use that as the analogy of just to look at students who have a background that does not include construction, but they are following my lead and are getting it. They're, 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 you can see the lights are going on and they are, um, they're, 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 they are following the program. That's great. <laughs> following the methodology that takes them to become someone who can be paid for their, their skills, tool belt on, on the job site. But they don't necessarily have to start with that experience. Okay, that's great. I think that's fantastic for our audience and our prospective students. Um, this, this project, like so many, comes out of, uh, I think, networks and things like that. And I know um, that both first and second year um, will work on these almost capstone projects year to year, uh, and that there's no shortage of opportunities for, uh, for you as faculty uh, to choose what best fits uh, curriculum. Um, what I'd like to do is walk down to uh, the Preservation Carpentry program with you. Sure. Um, and maybe as we go, could you, could you tell us uh, about how this, how this project, the John Hancock uh, door project, uh, came to be? Very good. That's a great lead, because you know my answer already. <laughs> Rob already knows why this is such a special project for our department. It's because the, of the connection that I drew years ago um, I used to work for Historic New England, and they're a part, they have been a partner organization to us, the largest house museum organization in the country. There are a few employees that work there full-time as preservation carpenters, doing what I did when I worked there 16 years ago. Um, there I learned of this great loss to Boston, to New England, and really the nation, which was a loss of this amazing piece of architecture in 1861, which was the home of John Hancock, one of our founding fathers, and the first signer of the Declaration of Independence. When that house was being threatened to come down, there was an outcry across the city, save the John Hancock mansion. There were posters on, uh, across the city, and, and it, it became a, became a movement. S sadly, the house was lost, but what that did is it, 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 it sort of became the launching pad for the idea of preserving our early architecture in America. So it became the martyr to that cause. I knew this story long before even coming here to teach. So fast forward 
to maybe six years ago, uh, just complete coincidence, I was working with another partner organization, the stewards of the old state house called the Bostonian Society. There, in one of their storage locations, they asked me when I was working with them to accept into our collection some things being deaccessioned. Would you like to see the, the front door to the John Hancock Mansion? And I, I, it came as a complete surprise, thinking it exists, one, and you saying it's here, oh yeah. So here it comes down the hallway, and due to circumstances that I don't need to go into here, we were asked to become stewards of the door, to take possession of it, to which we immediately built a custom crate, and the wheels started turning. Gee, would it be great to turn, to, to take this door and show it to the world, show it to, to folks and let them know what an amazing place this used to be, this, this building that spurred the whole movement of preservation carpentry, and our program. See, there's, the, there's a direct connection between saving architecture and what we do here at North Bennett. So that resulted in what, what I'm leaning on here. This is the reproduction of the, the surround to the front door. Now what you're looking at technically is the second story of our exhibit. Really, we're, I'm standing up 10 feet in the air. This is the second story, which will be sitting upon the first story, which is already built and is in storage. So the front door of the house, oh thank you, thank you Rob. So what you're looking at here, here, is just from here up. All of this, there's the front door right here. Um, this part's already been built in, years ago from, from the front stoop behind all these bushes. From here, there's a shutter, there's the door peeking out behind that shutter. And this first part was an exhibit at the old Bostonian Society's location at the old State House for a few years. This went into hibernation, and we started on the second phase, which is the upper portion, with the French door. This is a descendant of Hancock here, standing on, on, uh, on the balcony on this. Uh, and, and if you now pan back, you'll see this is what we're looking at here. All these turnings, um, the, the pilasters, the Corinthian capitals, the broken scroll pediments, all of this was done from photographs like this, and research that students participated in, combing through local historic libraries, looking for photos, looking for, for ledgers and, and logs to basically get these details correct. All the proportions taken from photos and research that students did. And, and this is the example of what can be done. Now, this, this is done by a group of students, but it's done with uh, basic fundamentals under their belt and then guided by, by uh, a highly trained um, expert in the field, Michael Burry, who you'll meet. So anyway, this has been a great project for us, and, but not, not the first and won't be the last. I just, this one comes, it really strikes to heart because of its connection to the, to the, uh, the start of the movement of preservation. Yeah, and it's, there's, it becomes sort of meta because, you know, the, our, it's, in many ways, the reason why this program uh, exists here. That's right. That's so right. let's walk down to uh, Preservation Carpentry, uh, and we can walk and talk a little bit, Stephen. Sure. Um, it's my understanding that uh, the door and the knocker were separated That's right. uh, once they destroyed the building and were categorized differently, and not until this project came around uh, were they brought back together, so. That's right, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, that the, the door knocker that is, is mounted to the door was separated for 100 years or more and was on the front door of a um, famous Boston lawyer. And uh, then upon the destruction of that house, gifted back to Bostonian. I don't think that they knew that the door was also part of the collection of Bostonian. Well, it wasn't until our project that the two came together again, probably for over a hundred years. And the other part of this is interesting is the lock. You remember we had the, the door has a big box lock on it. And another partner of ours where we have worked on and off is the old North Church right here in the North End, right? Another significant architectural gem from the 18th century connected to the revolution, of course, the lanterns being hung, Paul Revere, all of that. Well, we found out that they believed they have a key to the front door of the John Hancock Mansion in their collection. Well, we arranged for those to come together. 
<laughs> to have the key walked over just blocks away, brought and with the locksmithing department head in hand, giving the key to her and putting the key into the lock and watching with a tiny camera with a scope that was inside the box just to make sure there was no damage being done as, as the key is being turned, we got, the, the, we got confirmation. We had the key to the front door of the house, a key that was probably you know, either in John Hancock's pocket or someone working with someone assisting him. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty, this, these type of connections and the, the way to work with other departments is always great too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a mutual friend with Bob Miller, his name is Cliff Odell, um, and he's a black playwright who, when this project went over uh, to the old state house, uh, he wound up writing a play uh, that, that that piece was the centerpiece of the play, and he wrote it from the perspective of uh, John Hancock's servant. Yes. Uh, and so, in this way, we can never tell the life that is given uh, in addition to what the work is that we've done. And I just think it's such a lovely story that um, we focus on things here that sometimes are so specific, but there really is a universality uh, to the work, so. That's right. That sometimes they take a life of their own and take you on a path that you hadn't expected. Cool. So we're coming down the hallway to uh, the Preservation Carpentry Program. Um, they have a, a project that they're working on right now that involves uh, a lot of machining. And we'll go through the machine room, but a lot of times when I'll give a tour, I like to stop in this hallway because like the Hancock project, we can see some other projects here uh, that the program and Stephen have been involved in. First Parish Church. So here's a poster showing in the front of the building. We worked on this building for several years. Phase restoration of windows. Part of the curriculum in the first year of the program is windows, historic window sash restoration. So what we'll do is an historic building like this. We'll go to the site. We'll carefully remove the windows. We will uh, bag them and tag them and then bring them to some an off-site location where we do some removal of some lead paint, removal of the glass, we bring the wooden carcass of the window back here, and we'll go through the repairs needed, the woodworking repairs, of which all old windows need some. And so here's an example of a great church here in New England that we've worked on, and then another phase, one which was more complicated and was better suited to our second year students. So now the same client working with first year students becomes a, pro a client for a second year. And this poster here, describes the restoration of the steeple. And this image here is the finished product here, the steeple. And so from this point up was a project for second year students. And this gives you a little better view. Gives you an idea of the pile of debris that we started with and the remnant of the piece. And you can see the general condition here when we began. And then all kinds of statistics that uh, we've, we've been able to hammer like 7,842 man hours. And then I'll jump to costs and sash restored, 32 sash um, columns that are restored, right down to 400 cups of coffee consumed. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, that was just thrown in there for fun. But it involved a lot, framing, finish, w uh, carving, carving this 210 pound mahogany pineapple, which was gilding, we learned uh, to do gilding here woodwork and gilding, as well as uh, making reproduction windows, reproduction components, shingling, metal work. It, it was very comprehensive. And we look for projects that have suit and check a lot of boxes when right. we're going to tackle something as comprehensive as that. So that was a great project. Other projects here you can see, some we learn, uh, first year students learn basic construction skills by doing new construction. Sometimes it's building sheds, we're building sheds right now. The noise in the background are my students milling up Douglas fir and mahogany to build some double doors for those sheds. Sometimes we work on site to build to learn construction details. This addition, plugged onto the side of a 19th century building, was one of those projects. We can see students who are putting trim up and transom windows, sliding doors, and uh, trimming out and roofing and so forth. And what else? Uh, to the left, we have uh, an 18th century wood, woodworking mill, This an 18th century site 
down on the south shore of Boston called Hatch Mill. Here we did timber frame restoration as well as producing new timbers, replacing timbers, restoring old material and putting a whole new roof on it. So red cedar on double strapping, uh, this was guided through um, Michael Burry at MLB Restoration. And so that was a good project too. Anyway, yeah, lots of stuff here. Wasn't the hatch mill unique because the saw was, I don't know if it was reciprocal or yeah. like for its time, it seemed to be a, a unique kind of yeah. saw to be used. So this is, a, this is, the hatch mill is a great site because it's a remnant of earlier technology with a seven foot sash saw, up and down water powered sash saw. Right next to the site is a water, is a, a man-made pond and it's got uh, gates, sluice gates, and, and overshot wheels, and that's it's still an ongoing uh, adventure there. Great. It needs more time, more money, but uh, we're connected to it, and we're, gonna, we're happy to work here again. Cool. Show you some of the sash work. Here's a student all suited up, masks and Tyvek suits, pulling windows out, and some timber framing work over here. And this barn, I think, yeah. is from sometime around 1720? 1791. I was close. <laughs> so this is this barn here in this image is 1791, and um, this is this was sort of finishing up that big project, which was the restoration of the barn, um, and it went from foundation, stone foundation, timber frame repair, new construction timber timbers if needed. It was swinging axes and hewing logs into timbers. It, was, it went everything all the way down to making shingles. So it's very comprehensive again. So what you see here in this tent, this tent, and another shot here, these students are on shaving horses, and what they're doing is producing um, pine shingles. And then they go up to a planing bench and then up onto the roof. So in this image, this roof is being constructed, and it's, it's, um, it's being done completely the way it would have been done in, in the 1790s. And I think while this exercise is not something that happens for every single class, no. No. the concept of this exercise where you're going to take a yellow pine log and break it down to a place where you're making shingles for the specific project and then, and then putting them on, uh, this, is, this ought to resonate with people as the type of work that they're attracted to. Right. Let's go inside. See, it's going to be noisy. Yep. And we'll head to the first year bench room. So we've got, we've crammed in, uh, there's usually more benches than this, but you can see these are large German benches uh, that are uh, very nice to have in our program here. And um, we do all kinds of things here. Uh, as I mentioned, it, the program begins with tools, tool restoration, goes on to basic wood construction. We get out in the field, we're building, we're building uh, sheds as a way to learn stick framing, modern construction. But, Unlike an approach that carpentry with nine months to go might build a shed, we can slow things down. We can do things like salvage old doors and retrofit them by taking measurements and building jam units around them. And that's what's going on here. What we have here are white oak thresholds that are getting coats of, of varnish. Because, so we'll custom make from rough material, and that in itself is the lesson on the material, the wood, its nature, its properties, and then uh, taking the material and going through step by step through the woodworking machining portion. Handwork is probably uh, is, is always a part of it. What hand tools go to that's finish. And what we've done is, while well, yeah, you can go to Home Depot and you can buy uh, a threshold of a generic nature, but this project calls for more customization. So we'll start with the rough material, mill it, and profile it, and bring it. Uh, to, to the shape that corresponds to what we're doing. 
Also, this white prime material is the jam unit. So you can imagine there's, a, there's a, a vertical nature of this creating a box inside of which the doors will fit, mm -hmm. right? And so these, this, this is three separate sheds, so three separate wide doorway openings that will have double doors, and the noise in the background is, are the folks out there milling the material to thickness, width, length, and then profiling it in our shaper for a tongue and groove joint. So these pieces will be fit together with tongue and grooves. So it's again all done custom. So that's, uh, that one example might distinguish us from carpentry right. in that we are building new construction, aren't we? But we're bringing to it something a bit different. We're, we're, we are turning the construction of it in some ways into uh, uh, a more of a, of a learning opportunity by customizing components. That's great. And then I'm curious, um, the drivers for this, this project that we're looking at right now, is it that it's a client project? Is it that the, you're racing against the weather because it's an external yeah. project or yeah, is it curriculum? It's, it's in the curriculum yep. to, to learn stick framing. Sometimes that's building sheds of a generic nature, 10 by 12 of a certain height, certain roof pitch, windows in certain places. And we can repeat that each year to teach the, a whole bunch of lessons. But occasionally we'll have a client contact us and say, hey, I'd like to have something bigger, something taller, something done, built on my property. And we have done that. This past, uh, this, the crew that you'll meet, the second year students, had that a bit more of that opportunity. So one of the sheds they built, which was a much larger structure, uh, was built right on site, right on the client's property. And it included site uh, using uh, um, site preparation and foundation installation. So we put in concrete foundation for it and then began building the structure. We're gonna do that again next year. We've got a client where we're going to build on their property. But uh, in between which, we'll build at a place called Brookwood Farm. Uh, Brookwood Farm is our sort of unofficial right now. Knockwood might become more official. Okay. Uh, location in south of Boston, about 10 miles, 11 miles from here, called Brookwood Farm. And it's a 60 acre site owned by the state uh, the division of which is the DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation. And I figured for now, for 12 years, we've been working on this great farm setting where we have unlimited headroom because we're out, we're out in the farm, we're out on that, on that setting, and we have restored buildings, uh, we have, and we have built uh, on the property as well. Uh, none of these structures stay, we're just using the space, and so we consider it a bit of our off-campus off satellite sure. uh, location. So we spend part of our year there. Great. Yeah. Um, now, I, I have a healthy respect for finish work uh, and, that, and what its drying time is. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious if, um, if anyone uh, is interested in, um, in uh, talking with us um, in our, our audience here. Um, like you, before you came to the, the program, I feel like there are so many mysteries uh, on the pathway to coming to North Bend Street School for Preservation Carpentry. Um, so I, I'd love to hear uh, from you on sort of uh, what your pathway um, has been in coming here. Um, would you be interested sure. in sharing? Sure. Um, Thanks, Margo. So my name is Margo, uh, part of the first year program here in Preservation Carpentry. And um, what brought me to the program was a bit of COVID luck. <laughs> uh, tinkering around the house and realizing, you know, I went through college, I have a degree, and it, I, I am not a student who's built for desk work and um, this passion kind of came alive within COVID and uh, I like many of you tuned into the open house and it felt like everything and more was within North Bennett Street School Very and cool. uh, yeah everything that's hands-on the style of work we do here the the learning styles everything is something that I never would have expected but have been delighted to be a part of because it suits me as a learner and I finally feel like a capable competent learner that's great yeah. that's great um, if 
if there was something that you could share with someone that you didn't know, I mean, I feel like my, my team is always trying to figure out how to fill that gap of, of helping people to transition to thinking of coming this way. But, you know, we're human. We're going to miss stuff. Uh, from your perspective now, you know, what are some things that you could, like advice that you could give to someone uh, who is thinking of coming in this direction? Um, the advice that I would give is that you do not need any specific skill set to be a part of this program. You can come in and the way that Steven is as a teacher and the uh, ability for growth is extraordinary. And, and if you really are interested in something like this, this is the opportunity for you to step in and come into your own, even with very, very minimal experience like I had, and learn and feel extremely competent. And uh, it doesn't take much, but the passion, and I think that that sets the school part is that every single student here has the same passion that I came in with as well. That's great. Thank you so much, Margo. Thank you. Hi, I'm Teresa, and I uh, am a preservation carpentry first year student. Um, I watched the open house last year, like you folks at home were doing now, and was uncertain about the program. I was interested, and I, I think I even attended a summer open house with Rob. Um, and I was still kind of skeptical and not sure if I would have the skills to uh, be here. Um, I don't come from a construction background at all and um, I've been a flight attendant for 18 years. I'm still currently a flight attendant and um, the transition has been a huge one uh, and continues to be. But like Margot said, the growth um, potential in this program is like exponential. You come to school every day and you're doing these things that are completely out of your comfort zone sometimes and you just can't believe you're doing it and it's amazing. Um, you know, I'm, I am learning to use table saws and I'm learning joinery and things that I've always wanted to do um, and it's amazing. I couldn't be happier that I'm here um, it's challenging, but I think it is so rewarding and I'm, I'm so glad that I kept my curiosity when it came to the open house and the info sessions and kept asking more questions and um, ultimately went with my, my gut feeling was this is the place for me. How are you, A? <laughs> Good, how are you? Good. Will you share with us a little bit about uh, your story, about um, how you uh, uh, kind of found Preservation Carpentry as a program to come to and kind of what, what the process you went through uh, in order to make the leap to come here? And Yeah, um, I'm A. Uh, uh, I am the kind of person who would do this program probably. I really like uh, uh, doing something really tedious until it's totally finished and tuning something to perfection. And um, that has been, it hasn't been so much of a learning curve for me, uh, like other things have, um, but I come to this program without that much experience, um, a little bit of uh, shop experience, teensy tiny bit. Um, and I think the thing that really served me well before I came to this program um, and what I would, uh, the knowledge I would share is um, doing one or two intro to woodworking classes before you come here. I think it's nice to have been in a shop situation where you are tasked with, taught how to use the machinery, how to mill wood and how to cut on a table saw, I think, uh, helped, helped send me into this experience with a lot, of, a lot more confidence. And it's one of those things, you know, you spend a, a couple hundred bucks and really see whether or not you want to do this. It's a you great know? point. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So how are you liking now? Um, I keep telling everybody that um, having, uh, I like this program even more than I thought I would. Oh, God. I was like, I knew I was going to be obsessed with this. 
and uh, it's even more fun than I thought it was gonna be, which is crazy. Cause this is, I already know how much fun this is for me. Right. So it's, it's crazy that it's even more fun. Has there been sort of a, a moment or an experience, uh, you know, to date where you've been like, oh wow, I'm really surprised that, that uh, how cool this is mm. or, you know, some kind of aha moment. Yeah, I mean, share? I think that when Steven took us through the restoration of planes, I think that was, that was a big eye opener for me because it's uh, to be able to uh, take a take a, a plane from 1867, patented in 1867, and bring it back up to my use today. And the fact that it's just as useful as a tool serves the same purpose, um, and it is a as much use today as it was, you know, over a hundred years ago. I think that just you know that blew my mind. Yeah, it's very cool. It's like it's the so cool. The continuity and the application outlives us all. Right. We have to be a part of it. Right. Well, I mean, you know, in some of the readings, um, I think um, James Garvin wrote this book called um, uh, New, The Architecture of Northern New England or something like that. Um, and one of his points is that um, timber framing, what we learn in the second year, is just as, just as relevant to timber frames today. If you're going to build a timber frame, you're going to build it in much the same way that you would have built it throughout the centuries. And I think that, you know, that is getting down to the roots of how to make a building is so fun and so rewarding. Cool. Yeah. All right. So we'll go with Steven and we'll go around the dog leg here and we'll go visit um, uh, second year preservation carpentry. Okay. Here you go. Yep. <laughs> hey, Michael. How are you? Don't you go anywhere. Go on. <laughs> I guess you can. You're allowed to. So where are we now, Stephen? We're uh, we're in a in a sort of a hybrid space in our department. It's a combination machine shop, but it's also bench space for three students. So behind me, there's a, one of these benches, uh, but to the left, behind these plexiglass screens, is our lathe, one of our lathes which isn't being used right now, but when it is, we've got these screens because there's somebody sitting just a few feet away. So this space is more flexible, where most of the time it's bench space, sometimes we need the specialized gear, like a lathe or ar around here, this hollow chisel mortiser machine. This mortising machine is plowing out these mortises in these, in these uh, plank frame thresholds that are being made in second year, second year students. But right next to it, there's a drafting board. So <laughs> this is a bit of a flexible space. Us. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. So we're going to head into the second year bench room now. I can, I can be useful. <laughs> and what do we have here, Stephen? Michael, why don't you have Michael! This is a Michael project. The Michael project. Uh, so what we have here, we're, Memorial Hall is a 1791 federal period house that we're uh, doing some preservation work on. It's uh, over in Charlestown, Massachusetts. It's um, been converted over to, uh, in 1886, the um, veterans from the Civil War purchased the building and they turned it over to their veterans hall. I think Steve might know more about the history of it at this point, but uh, what we're doing is we're restoring the front facade and the, and the side elevation uh, to the look it had in the 1888 through 1920s time period. So we're taking down uh, parts of the, uh, uh, the plank frame windows and restoring the sash to the 1888 time period, uh, repairing the, the plank frames and the clavered and uh, front door surround and so all that is being reworked and preserved. So. That's great. So all the students are taking on different parts of the project. Uh, some are doing clavards, some are doing, uh, most are doing the plank frame windows. You can through the, the bench room. You can see all the parts that we uh, took off, original 1791 windows 
are in here, and uh, these are the ones. There was only four that we could really restore back to full use. And the uh, other ones you have, the, you're going to have to reproduce. Yeah, we're reproducing the rest of them. So you can see the patching in uh, to replace elements that have been lost or broken away over the years. Uh, you know, they need little rut pockets that might need to be filled in. So each one of those is part of the curriculum in terms of just you know repairing something and getting it, keeping it going for another hundred years or hundred and some some odd years. So this makes me think uh, about the concept of sustainability in construction. And I think I've heard Stephen say before that there's really nothing more sustainable than wood. And as I look at the at at these windows that are being reproduced, this this thought uh, occurs to me. Um, will either of you uh, talk to that concept? Well, yeah. I mean, in terms of green building, there's uh, kind of movement back to you know sustainable building practices. But you know, the most sustainable building is one that already exists. And these are all produced, you know, without any fossil fuels. Uh, you know, they're done under water power and human power. Uh, so, you know, and they exist already. So keeping these buildings continuing on into the next centuries, you know, makes a lot of sense in terms of you know, environmental awareness and, and sustainability. That's right. And although in the 19th and 20th century, there are hazards that like asbestos and like lead paint that we deal with. Of course, we're, we, everything we touch has lead paint, but, um, Really, the building materials themselves are what? They're wood and glass and stone and naturally mined lime and horsehair and wood, of course. So these, these, in some ways, are healthier homes, these vintage homes, and they, they are adaptable to modern living and should be protected and preserved and work, uh, and you can even work around the, what would otherwise be strict code compliance on new construction. Most towns allow you to work an historic building into a livable uh, context by approaching code, and we've 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 done that many times. Um, so, uh, in this particular case, this is a this is a hall essentially. It's a it's a it's more of a um, a space that is a nonprofit. They're a nonprofit, nonprofit organization, yeah. and so I'm sure that in another context, perhaps if it was still a private home. Even so, I think that the owners, owners would have been allowed to make some um, rest restoration and recreation of original parts and not have to put in a, a, new, a set of new windows into the building. So we're giving this, the front elevation, which is our responsibility primarily, the front elevation, a, a, a facelift and reviving and restoring the, some of the original components. But talk about the windows. So, the interpretive time period, uh, which was dictated by a, what the, both the client as well as their hired uh, preservation uh, consultants and architect, preservation architect, came up with that 1880 something time period. Yeah. Yeah. And so none of the windows in the building now um, are, are connected to that time period. So a new set of windows had to be Right? And so talk about right, the windows. Yeah. The new sashes. Um, you know, everything had been replaced by you know, vinyl replacements or you know, some uh, just a quick and dirty window just to get tight to the weather again. And so we're taking those out and replacing and reproducing the sash that once existed there, Victorian sash, so 1888 time period, one over one sash. Yeah, and interestingly, you know, students who began on that project of window making uh, were, had just learned window making and were producing windows for two project houses, one of which was Memorial Hall we're talking about. The other one was also being being um, uh, overseen by the same group of preservation architects, right? Yeah. And that's in the town of Canton. Uh, same place as Brookwood Farm, of course, same town. But anyway, those students timed out at the end of their graduation. They were right steeped in window making. They had it in their hands. They had the skills down. They offered themselves up to continue and finish and make the windows, install the windows post graduation, and on commission as a contractor. So that's a that's a that rolled right over from the work they were doing as a second year student, and then doing it post graduation as a contractor essentially, and uh, so that was good to see as well, because it's good resume building. Yep. It's good for their their ego and and their confidence to 
producing a product for a real a real house that is we're still working on. It's still the same client. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask one more question uh, of of Michael and Stephen, and and then I'd like to go and take a look at what some of the students are working on. And I'd also just want to ask you just for a minute. Um, if you could all just hold off uh, on the hammering. I get that's why you're here, uh, and I promise that we will be gone relatively soon. Uh, but I, I want to ask uh, Michael and Stephen both, do you have any advice for uh, anyone who is thinking of coming in this direction to train for uh, preservation carpentry? From your vantage point, and I know Stephen, you're a graduate, Michael, you're not a graduate, but you've spent a, a whole lot of time uh, within this world. Um, so could you, could you please share um, with our audience, uh, what are some, uh, some, what's some advice that you can give to people who are thinking of coming in this direction? Well, the biggest advice I have, I mean, there's a, in New England especially, and all across the Eastern Seaboard and into the Midwest and out in California, you know, everywhere we go, there's historic architecture. You know, this, in California, of course, 1849 is the big, big time period when things really moved in. So it's not as old as what we have here. The oldest house we have here is 1641. It's the Fairbanks house in Dedham. But there's a huge number of historic houses in the area that all of them need work on them. So there's always work to be done. Uh, there's, there's very challenging work and interesting work. It's not the repetitive day-to-day -day mm -hmm. work that a modern carpenter might have, but every house you approach has got a whole different set of issues, similar issues, and there's a lot of owners of those houses who are looking for qualified people to, to work on them, and there just aren't enough people out there doing that sort of work, and the students who leave here, leave here are uh, fully in demand. You know, there's plenty of uh, work to be done through the recession that came, what, 2008 onwards. I thought I'd be dead in the water, but I actually ramped up and I hired people on during that time period because there's there was enough work that had to be done then. Wow, oh, great points. Thank you, Michael. So the jobs are there, the buildings are there. We need people to work on them. Yep, that's right. Stephen, yeah, what about yourself? Well, I'll, I'll add oh. that you, you've talked to some of my students a few minutes ago. They've told, shared a little bit about their story and uh, their experience, maybe, and why they came to the program and with whether they're liking their experience so far or not. But I can tell you, from my experience as a career changer, I had worked in corporate America as a financial analyst. That was my background. I had hobbies that were related to woodworking and finishes, and I always liked old houses. But it wasn't until I had this opportunity, this, this opportunity to leave, to get off that train and go in a different direction, where I felt that I, I use the analogy of a dartboard, you know, I, I was throwing darts at the dart. I wasn't even on the board with my previous career. And going to school, I was, I was honing in on, on that bullseye. And um, so I'll just share that um, North Bennett, using the Sloyd system, which you may have talked about with, uh, as it relates to all of our programs, mm -hmm. this progressive system can take someone with aptitude and interest in early architecture and working with your hands and carving out a career for yourself in this in this field, we can get you there. But you have to be prepared. Be prepared financially, be prepared to know that you're gonna take a couple of years out of your life and you're gonna be spending a lot of money, but it's, it's this is a great investment. This is a huge investment in your future, doing something you love to do. And I can say as an instructor and contractor that um, really, I know it seems sort of hokey, because I'm uh, just like the, the slogan the school is using: "If you do what you love, you're not you, you, uh, every you do do what you love every day, or something like that." And that's really the case. Uh, uh, and and I, I think that we've got a lot of graduates out there that have come through the program, that have been given a new start, and um, and so uh, we are sympathetic. I am sympathetic. We we really understand the challenges that our students and the big risks that they're taking to make such a change. But we can tell you from all of these testimonials you're hearing, and I would think that if you talk to graduates who've been out in the field for a while, mm -hmm. they'll also share the same, the same, uh, the same heartfelt... Uh, uh, I can verify that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this is a, it's a special place. There's really nothing else like it in the country. 
and so um, uh, with with um, with that with knowing that you'll know that you uh, found safe harbor here <laughs> and you uh, you'll learn a lot you'll work hard and you'll develop really good skills that will pay off uh, you'll be able to um, to go out and be that specialist in the trades you'll have new construction skills true but you'll be able to to really hone in on uh, this art this early architecture that we love so much and um, take it back to your hometown your home state and and maybe be uh, the dominant force in your in your uh, in your uh, neighborhood so anyway that's um, great yeah I appreciate the tour and uh, all of your insight uh, thank you so much Stephen and Michael so go say hello to some second year students see what they're up to uh, any volunteers to uh, to speak with us and show you what you're working on? Yeah, sure. That's great. Um, yeah, so as you heard, we're uh, building some new windows and window frames uh, for Memorial Hall, and this will be the sill of one of the new frames. Um, right now I'm just cutting mortises for the vertical styles and uh, yeah um, we've been working on this for a couple weeks uh, this fall we built a new small structure uh, in sort of a 18th century New England timber frame style um, yeah what else can I say um. I'm curious because I think one of the things I recall about um, you as a person is I think you have had experience um, in construction, preservation. Yeah, well, I'd say the proximate cause perhaps of a, uh, my matriculation is my father-in-law is a book dealer who deals in uh, especially trade catalogs and uh, trade books especially for preservation. So that's sort of how I heard about the school and really became acquainted with the notion of a specialist in preservation. But long before I got engaged or married, um, like my first job in high school was as a carpenter's assistant. I was, I've always worked with my hands. I went to a good college, but I just really did not get any joy from the sort of jobs that set me up for. And so I went back to carpentry and ended up here eventually that's great i appreciate you sharing your story we've talked with a lot of people that have not had a lot of construction experience so i just wanted to kind of round that round that out because i think we have such diversity and experience from people as they transition here i wanted to make sure that we uh, yeah. heard from you i'd say my experience has served me well and also um read a lot there's so much to read about this stuff and it's really so interesting and it, it really it constantly redounds to my benefit that i've read this book or that yeah great thank you so much yeah. well what are you what are you working on share with us uh, so i was just uh sorting through the clapboards for uh memorial hall in uh, charlestown uh for that project uh, and basically, I was just sorting them out for length. And then next thing that we're going to do is prepare them to go up. So we have to skive, just kind of slice off the ends so that when we put them together, they can overlap okay. and go up on the building. So that's, that's what I'm doing right now. And so the, the older piece or original piece yeah. there, whatever it, uh, it is, you're going to make an assessment on can it be repaired, does it need to be replaced? And yeah, I think, so I think they've already gone through like, so this one's just in tatters. Yes. It's, uh, it's not, not good for use anymore. So basically taking uh, the new pieces, make sure that they're the correct length. Yep. And then preparing them to replace, yeah, the old, the old battered ones. Cool. Yeah. And then would you share with us um, uh, your story, your kind of journey uh, in coming to North Bennett Street School? Yeah, uh, I was always interested in uh, DIY things. I bought a house, did a lot like the baseboard, insulated it, gutted it. Uh, so I'd done a lot of that. But growing up, I hadn't had that much. And uh, <laughs> my, my dad was one of those people that I couldn't change a light bulb without breaking something. So I, I think I was motivated 
by that. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was a teacher for about 16 years. Uh, basically fell out of the love of that <laughs> and yeah. I was looking for something else. And, and this, after working on my house, it was, I really enjoyed working on old houses and, uh, so yeah, I took that and decided to dive right in and come here. Good. So the timing was good for a redirection. Yeah. You put your time into teaching. Yeah, and it, it and thank God because I like I needed to uh, I don't know save up some money <laughs> to come here. <laughs> but it was it was it was it was good while it lasted. But it was it's good to have a change, and uh, this was a good segue into the next chapter of life. <laughs> cool. And then with your time here in preservation carpentry, is there, is there uh, some experience that you've had that uh, has been sort of a, like a, an aha moment for you or that you could uh, talk about? Um, God, there've been quite a few, I think. Like last year working in a PC one with Steve, it's a lot of hand tools, chisel work, uh, hand planes, stuff like that. And working with those tools is just, fun and gratifying and just you just get into a rhythm of things and it's just it's just uh smooth sailing and it's just you just fall into a rhythm and you just time goes by and you don't realize it you know it's like one of those things yes so like you have like those experiences just learning the skills but then like this year we're doing like timber framing was uh was definitely another one of those moments in bigger scale uh just seeing how things get put together seeing how they're built seeing how everything fits together and just the complexity, but also the simplicity of it. Uh, that was, that's been a lot of fun and interesting to learn that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us on our open house tour of preservation carpentry. Uh, I hope that you learned a lot from your visit. Um, if this is a place you're thinking of uh, applying to, to come and train uh, with us, I absolutely encourage you to do that. This Friday at 11 a.m., um, you can RSVP for our full-time uh, career training program information session for all of the programs. Uh, there are also many other channels uh, that, you can, that you can reach us. Uh, you can email admissions at mbss.edu. Uh, you can call the school, um, and we're grateful for uh, you attending. Thank you so much.